Right, hello everybody, and uh, welcome to today's Martin Audio webinar training. Uh, today we're going to be looking at wavefront precision and look, taking a look at the uh, the cabinets themselves, the rigging, um, different configurations, how the amplifiers work with uh, the um, the closed ecosystem system, and yeah, let's crack on. So my name's Simon, I'm a product support engineer here at Martin Audio and it's my job to help with any kind of training, any kind of support that I can give any of our clients and customers. Um, I do a lot of system design work for venues and clubs all over the world and yeah, I do a lot of hands-on training as well if, uh, if people buy um, our larger systems and present demos and things like that. But today, obviously, we're here talking about WP with webinar training. This is a bit of a brief overview of what we're going to be looking at. And uh, yeah, so we're going to be looking at the loudspeakers themselves, the rigging, the amplification and DSP. Really brief look at the software just to um, kind of round it up at the end and also the system configurations. So let's go ahead and look at uh, the features of the system. So we've got two um, two loudspeakers in this uh, range, two modules, if you will, of uh, the line arrays. We've got the smaller of the two, which is the WPM, that's the Wavefront Precision Mini. Uh, this is an ultra compact line array. Uh, of course, takes advantage of our scalable resolution for uh, advanced array control. We've got a three point rigging system. It's got extremely smooth horizontal pattern control and a dedicated multi-channel class D amplifier, which is the Icon 81. And obviously you can use this in conjunction with our extremely accurate prediction software, which is Display 2.3, and that is uh, the same software that you can use to optimize WPC, WPM, MLA, O-Line, any of our optimized line arrays. So it's a two-way passive box. You've got a frequency response of 76 Hertz, uh, all the way up to 18K. Got a max SPL of 130. We use a plus 6 dB crest factor, so it's a continuous um, SPL of 124. Again, you got the 100 degrees horizontal coverage, and each box has got a 10 degree vertical coverage angle, but obviously that's array dependent, so the more cabinets you have, the, uh, the, more, uh, the higher in degrees your vertical coverage is going to be. Each of these boxes is a 16 ohm normal impedance, so that allows us to uh, link them together in different uh, resolutions. And each cabinet weighs 14 kilos. So a closer look at the actual elements within the cabinet. You've got three 1.4 inch horn-loaded neodymium compression drivers. And the use of multiple small HF drivers uh, in this way, instead of larger diaphragm drivers, results in less distortion and an extended HF response, and it also helps us with our, um, our horizontal coverage. The LF components, you've got two 6.5 inch uh, contour diaphragm LF drivers. And the left drivers are located, as you can see in the picture there, um, just on the side walls of the horn. And each LF driver has a solid molded diaphragm and low diffraction surround, which co closely uh, follows the contours of the horn wall. And this gives us our uh, extremely even 100 degree horizontal coverage. So moving up a size, this is the WPC. So this is the Wavefront Precision Compact. And as you can see, it's very similar to the WPM, but this is a uh, the larger format of the two. This is a compact design. Again, you can use scalable uh, resolution. It is also a three point rigging system. Still got that smooth 100 degree uh, horizontal coverage. You've got a dedicated multi-class, um, multi-channel class D amplifier, which this time is the Icon 42. And of course, this works with our display software. This is a three-way biamp uh, product. So you've got the LF on one channel, and then your second channel is your mid-range and higher frequencies with a passive crossover. So it's a three-way two-channel system. Uh, you've got a frequency response slightly lower with uh, the larger format going from 18 kilohertz all the way down to 65 hertz. You've got a maximum SPL of 135. Again, with that being the peak, so the continuous is 129. Again, with a, um, the same coverage pattern as the WPM, and this being the larger format box, this module weighs 35 kilos. So looking at the individual components, this time we've got four 0.7 inch horn-loaded neodymium compression drivers. 
And again, using the uh, multiple smaller format drivers in this way just helps us with um, extended response, lower distortion, better coverage. In the mid-range, we've got two five-inch horn-loaded drivers. And using the uh, the horn rather than a traditional direct radiating just gives us just a little bit more control. There's less turbulence as always of a horn. And in the LF section, we've got two 10-inch uh, slot-loaded hybrid LF drivers. So they're ported at the back uh, to give them that extra efficiency, but the horn on the front, of course, also improves our directivity and it reduces turbulence. So you're getting less of that air noise and just more clean tone. And with these two... <clears throat> These two line arrays come with um, a whole bunch of uh, different subwoofers that can kind of sit, suit any environment that you ever might need to deploy them in. Uh, the smallest of which is the SXF115. And that's a, a single 15 inch direct radiating subwoofer. It'll send your uh, low frequency response down to 50 hertz. Got a max SBL of 136, so continuous 130. The coverage is on the directional cardioid. Obviously, that completely depends on how many subwoofers you have and how you're uh, how you're deploying them. Um, your nominal impedance is four ohms, and it's a 45 kilo unit. And we recommend this as a sub reinforcement for WPM. We probably wouldn't use it with the WPC just because of the larger format you're going to need um, a larger subwoofer. So the next one up, we've got a single 18, which is the X, the SX118. Again, it's just a direct radiating 18-inch uh, driver. Frequency response now extends down to uh, 41 hertz. Maximum SPL of 138. So continuous, you're looking at 132 dB. Pretty loud subwoofer, pretty powerful. Again, your coverage, however you, uh, however you wish to deploy it. Your impedance is 8 ohms, and your box weight is 47 kilos. And now with that extended um, LF power you can uh, you can start using that with the WPC as well as the WPM. Next one up is the SX218. So this is a dual direct radiating uh, <coughs> oh, excuse me uh, subwoofer. Your frequency response obviously because now you've got the uh, the double eighteen you're going down to 30 Hertz. Maximum SPL 144 so continuously you look at 138. Again your coverage however you uh, determine that you want to deploy your system. Normal impedance, you've got two times eight ohms, so you're, um, they're actually not wired in parallel, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit uh, more detail shortly. And it's 102 kilos, so it's quite a heavy, um, quite a heavy unit, this one. Going the next stage up, which is uh, the largest in the series, is the SXH218. So this is a dual hybrid horn slash reflex. Um, so as you can see, the, the horn on the front and also the ports on, um, on the top and bottom corners there. And this basically just maximizes efficiency and gives you a, an extended low frequency response without the turbulence and the, the wobble of the air. So you've still got that tight base at really uh, quite low frequencies. You've got a max SPL of 148 dB. So it's a massive um, SPL. Um, well, just a huge SBLP, incredibly powerful subwoofer. So it's going to give you a continuous 142 dB if you should ever require that much sub. Again, your coverage is determined by however you wish to deploy it on the direction of a cardioid. Uh, impedance at 8 ohm box, and it's 120 kilos. It's probably a good four man lift. And yeah, you can use this with WPM or WPC. So the benefits of this system. In, in whatever uh, configuration you want to use it, is that you get consistent coverage achieved straight out of the box with a scalable resolution for advanced array control. So by the time our software has done the work and you've put a little bit of um, the, the preparation in and you've uploaded your uh, files to the amplifiers, it, it just sounds great all around the room. Uh, the display software reduces your setup time and it eliminates trial and error because you can see 
um, the results within the software, so you don't have to second guess yourself. The uh, the results in in terms of direct SPL, so obviously we can't take into account the reverberant field, but if you're looking at the direct SPL in the software, they they are accurate to plus or minus one dB, so you you can definitely trust it. Um, you have improved audience coverage with reduced um, sound spill because of within the coverage, as um, you'll know if you've ever used it or if you've taken part in one of our display webinars. Um, yeah, you, you, you can define your audience areas, your hard avoid, your non-audience to give you the kind of um, the, the output that you require for that system in any given venue. <clears throat> so all in all, a, a very, it's a time-saving system uh, and it sounds better. So let's look at the rigging. And there is quite a lot of rigging for uh, the, the system depending on however you want to apply it. And again, it is extremely flexible. So this is the rigging uh, that we have available for the Wavefront Precision Mini, the WPM. <clears throat> so you've got a, a touring flyby. You can see it with the, um, the ground stack stabilizers on it there. There's an outrigger for the SXF115 subwoofer if you, in case you want a pole mount on it. MLA Mini um, flying frame. That is if you just want to fly the subwoofers. Or again, you can fly the SXF115 with the WPM below it as well if you need to. There's a, a long ground set bar and a short ground set bar depending on the angles that you require for uh, your ground stack. Uh, obviously, you've got the, the WPM three-point captive rigging. Uh, you've got an install flybar. It's pretty much, well, it is very similar to uh, the touring flybar, but with uh, just reduced uh, kind of capabilities. So there isn't an inclinometer mount, and you don't have those ground stack bars simply because you just don't need them if you're doing a permanent install. And uh, your universal bracket. And you've also got a transition grid, which will um, transition from a flown SX, F115 to the WPM because, as we'll see in a minute, the, the subwoofers have, have got a four-point rigging uh, system and the WPM is obviously a three-point. So you can look closely, uh, a little bit more closely at each of them. So this is the WPM enclosure. As you can see, you've got a three-point rigging system. So two, two at the front, one at the back. <clears throat> um, but you have got four pins. So basically that means that you have one to create your link and the other one is a lock pin. So that's going to make sure that your boxes don't collapse together if you're using them in ground stack. Oop, gone the wrong way. Uh, so here's your ground stack bar. Uh, not ground stack bar, the, uh, the touring grid, sorry. As you can see at the front, you've got the ground stack stabilizers. So that's just going to give you a little bit more um, stability if you are ground stacking. Uh, you can use this if you're flying in a one or two point lift. Uh, the software display 2.3 will tell you on the rigging page. If you're doing a one point lift, it will tell you which hole to use to achieve the uh, the angle you want. Uh, you can see you've got a laser mount there, which actually that's the inclinometer mount, allowing you to uh, remotely check your downward or upward tilt if you're using a two point rig. Um, you can ground stack up to 6 WPM on this, and you can fly uh, within BGVC1 um, certification at 16 WPM, and it weighs only 7 kilos, so it's a very light flybar to have such strength behind it. Um, and here we've got the uh, the ground stacks. Uh, this is when you're deploying your array in it on the touring grid as a ground stacked array. Uh, I've got some um, slides in a minute where we're gonna look at how you deploy it flown, but because the, the flown arrays are deployed in, in the same way across the uh, the whole range, I just wanna show you once at the end rather than going through it for each of the arrays. So again, you can do a max um, a maximum of six WPM on, uh, on these touring bars with uh, the ground stacking bars, depending on whether you want the short one or the long. And as you can see on the left, you've got the, uh, the long ground stack bar, and that's going to allow you to aim um, anywhere between minus six and minus 20 degrees. So if you've got quite a, um, a flat audience area, but if you wanted to get a little bit more of a um, up tilt, then if you go for the short ground stack bar, then as you can see, you can go from a plus five to minus four. So it just depends on how you want to deploy your system and the, the coverage you're trying to require. And of course, display 2.3 will tell you all of this information uh, depending on what you've inputted into the, uh, into the software itself. So then you've got the WPM install grid. 
Uh, it's the same three-point rigging system, and it, you know it's, it's the same uh, two-point or one-point lift. You're just missing the uh, ground stack stabilizers and the inclinometer uh, mounting point. And this only weighs five kilos again, and you can still fly uh, 16 WPM off it if required. <clears throat> uh, you've got the universal bracket. Uh, there is a pole mount assembly um, like rigging accessory, and you can literally just screw that onto the base plate on the bottom, and then you can just pole mount that on top of a well, on, on top of any uh, pole you like, but also on top of an SXF uh, one one five subwoofer if you require. But we'll look at that in a second. And you can also, uh, or you can fly up to four WPM on uh, a single universal bracket, and it only weighs five kilos. And as you can see here, we've used an MSX outrigger with an SXF 115 subwoofer, just screwed a pole directly into the, uh, into the plate on the top of the subwoofer. And using a pole mount assembly, we've then been able to um, just deploy four WPMs as a pole mounted system. And you can have up between uh, zero and minus 18 degrees of uh, down tilt on that. You can also use a universal bracket to, uh, to, to fly up to 4 WPM from um, some scaff or some truss. And you can actually interchange the bar and the linking point on the universal bracket. Because as you can see, it, right in the top in the middle there, we've got our bar on the right and our link pin on the left. You can actually swap these around and that's going to give you a difference of, okay, today I want to be able to deploy it from 0 degrees to minus 18 degrees downward tilt. But if I swap the uh, the bar and that link pin around, I can actually go from zero degrees to plus 18, uh, depending on whatever I need to do. And uh, again, display in the rigging page. If you print a rigging report, that's going to tell you all the information you need. So the MLA Mini flying frame, this is for the SXF115. This is a four-point rigging system. So not like the WPM with the three-point. This is the four-point rigging system. It's a main flying frame for the SXF-115 and WPM if you want to fly them on the same uh, point. <clears throat> you can fly eight SXF-115s off uh, one of these frames, and it still passed the BGCV-1 uh, certification, and it weighs 17 kilos. Now, as I mentioned before, because the X the SXF-115 is a four-point rigging system. You need a transition frame to go from uh, a flown subarray to your WPM. So this is a transition between a four-point to a three-point lift, and that will just sit underneath your SXF-115s. You can have up to three of uh, the subwoofers flown above it, connecting to 12 WPM below, and that is uh, only weighs six kilos. So here's an example of uh, what we've been saying. So obviously we've got two here and uh, eight below, but you could have three, MSX, um, three SXF-115s, then moving on to a transition frame onto the, uh, the 12 WPM below it. Or you can just stack, um, or you can fly eight SXF-115s from a single um, MLA mini frame, as you can see on the left. So moving on to... Wavefront uh, Precision Compact. So again, this is the uh, the, the 10-inch uh, larger format in the in the series. You've got a touring bar, exactly the same as the uh, WPM install bar, exactly the same as WPM. Obviously, they're larger format. They weigh more. They're tested to uh, to carry more. And uh, we've got a single ground stack uh, bar, which uh, we will look at in more detail in a second. So again, you've got the same. Uh, format of uh, a three-point rigging system, although the linking hardware behind uh, on, on the back of a WPC is slightly different, but it does work in uh, a very similar way. Apart from with the WPC system, you actually got pre-selectable um, intercabinet angles behind uh, on the actual uh, mechanical hardware. So I can actually pre-select my angles in uh, the warehouse, put it on a dolly, and then when I go to the arena, I can just fly uh, four at a time, and as the as the motor lifts them up, I can just put my lock pins in and all the angles are done for me straight away. So that's another really good uh, time-saving uh, design feature of, of this system. Looking at the, uh, the the touring grid, it is exactly the same. You've got, you've got all of uh, your single-point lift positions or you've got a one or uh, two-point motor lifts. 
again, you've got your ground stack stabilizers. You can fly 16 WPC from a single touring frame. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Or uh, you can ground stack six WPC above it. Again, you've got your uh, your inclinometer mount on the side of it there for remote um, for for remote monitoring of your downward angle. And this is a 13 kilo frame. So looking at the ground stack bar, you can see that we've got one bar which achieves um, all the way from minus 20 to plus five for the WPC. So you use a longer side of it for your your flatter angles. If you want a more up tilt, then you're using the, the, the shorter side of the ground stack bar. But I can show you this in a little bit more detail on this slide. So as you can see, we've got naught to plus five on the, on the shorter arm. If we then rotate the ground stack bar, we can go from minus six to minus 20. And again, all of this information was just, um, it, it's just outputted from display and it will tell you which hole to use. It should be very clear. Uh, the installation grid, uh, again, you've got one or two point uh, lift and you've just got the removal of the ground stack stabilizers and the inclinometer mount. Uh, the three point uh, rigging system, obviously, all the way down for the WPC. A maximum of 16 WPC uh, boxes for this grid. It's a very cost effective flying solution because we try to remove a lot of the, uh, the metal work that you don't need while still complying with the BGC B1 status. And this weighs uh, 10.5 kilos, so it's pretty light as well. It doesn't add too much to your uh, your motor weight capabilities. Now, this is the same um, across the range for the, the install um, brackets. Well, the, the, the information on this page. So, for whether it's WPM or it's WPC, it's a max of 16 boxes for the relative frame. And the link between the grid and the first WPM or WPC is where display determines the height of the array. So if you put your array as uh, in display, you, you put it in the software at five meters, then it is that point between the grid and the array that is at five meters. So if you've only got, um, if your ceiling is exactly six meters, then you might want to deploy your array uh, I don't know, four meters might be more logical, but give yourself the room that the downward angle is going to have an effect of the height of the back of the frame. And um, obviously, the display is uh, just going to do what it's told. So whatever you put it, the more accurate, the more knowledge you have of how the system works, the uh, the, the better your deployment can be. And again, you can see you can do it down with uh, a one or a two point lift. So that's enough of the rigging. Let's take a quick look at system configurations, which there are many. And the first thing you kind of have to understand with uh, the, the W system is scalable resolution to understand uh, all of the kind of deployment capabilities so what is scalable resolution well depending on the needs of a venue or depending on the the DSP you have available the spare amplifier channels you have available you can have a kind of a higher or a lower um, quality product depending on what you need but safe in the knowledge that an optimized system is always going to be better than a non-optimized one. So if we look at the the, uh, the the first picture on the left here, we've got three box resolution. So this is WPC in this example. So obviously it's a biamp box and that's why we're calling it a channel set if you look at the words below. But a three box resolution, you've got three cabinets and you've got, in the case of WPC because it's biamp, you've got two channels of um, audio and DSP coming from the amplifier. Um, not two channels of audio, two, two channels of amplification and DSP. If we then move up and be like, actually, we need more control, we need higher quality, then we can move to a two box resolution. <clears throat> so now you can see we've got two boxes of WPC for one channel set. If we need it even further than that, we need the absolute premium quality and the highest control that we can muster, then we can tell display to optimize our array in a one box resolution, and then we're going to wire it with a single um, NL4 to each of those boxes, and that's just going to give us um, the, the best possible result because we have the, the best possible control of the system. We can actually show that here. <clears throat> so if we look at this graph, this is just a standard line array with no optimization at all. Um, and it's also worth noting that this is just a relatively flat graph. So there's just relative level. This isn't a, like an EQ graph or a, 
or um, a systems output. This is just a graph of relative level. So the red line is the audience front row. Yellow line is the mix position. Green line is the audience back row. And uh, the blue is the rejection behind the loudspeaker. So on the stage, I guess. So again, this is just a standard array with no optimization. As soon as, even if we go to a free box uh, resolution, you can see how we've started to bring the, the, the front row, the mix position and the audience closer together. And we're also getting uh, lower um, SPL levels behind the, uh, the array. So a quieter stage, which is always good. Going to a two box resolution, and you can see we're really starting to flatten this out. So now we're almost achieving a plus or minus seven, eight dB from the very front, right across uh, the low frequencies, like to the back row. And we've actually got pretty good um, like SPL reduction behind the, uh, the array itself. Moving to one box resolution, and you can see that it's incredibly flat with uh, probably a plus or minus three dB across the entire audience area. And the rejection behind the loudspeaker is almost minus 25 dB at some frequencies. So you get an incredible um, rejection from the back. I can just go back through these again really quickly just so you can see the difference. Oh, too far. So there's your standard array, three box resolution, two box resolution to your one box resolution. And that's straight out of the box using the display software. So once you've uploaded our optimization into the amplifier, <clears throat> That is um, that is the kind of response that you're um, you, you can you can expect depending on the resolution that you've used. So th the benefits of this scalable resolution is that you can design systems to better suit your project budget. As in, I don't have the budget to send out all of my amplifiers to this gig, so I'm going to do this gig at uh, a lower resolution. So you've got a, a kind of a better than a better than average quality. Um, system as always but i don't want to make it absolutely premium because the client you're uh, you're simply not making the money for it for an install or even for a rental company you've also got the ability to increase your resolution over time by buying more amplifiers so you can even go into a, an existing venue you can rewire the, um, the speaker system and you can have a higher quality better output system in the same space without changing the loudspeaker you're just changing the amplification and the DSP. And rather than fixed rental pricing for one system type, scalable resolution unlocks dynamic rental pricing based upon the needs of the venue event or tool. Like I said, if you, you could split your arrays or split your amplifiers uh, depending on what you require or what your client requires in any given situation. And you have greater flexibility on an event with maybe higher resolution on the main PA and then rest less resolution on, on the uh, delay system or even outfills or w whatever you require uh, the system for. You can be very flexible with it. So th this is just a, a quick look at uh, the kind of configurations uh, from here. So obviously this is the WPM and that can be used with any of the, uh, the subwoofers in the range. Obviously with display um, array optimization, that's display 2.3 and an IK amplifier rack. So eight boxes of WPM. Obviously, you've uh, defined uh, your your needs for coverage in Display 2.3. So you've uh, you can then export your preset, which is called a D2P file, which you would load to the amplifiers. But WPM, you got from 18 kilohertz all the way down to 76 hertz. You, ha you can use um, you can use an Icon 81 or a um, Icon 42 for WPM. Uh, but we'd recommend uh, Icon 81 because you don't need the uh, the amount of power that's in the Icon 42. And you've got your 100 degree horizontal and, again, array dependent vertical coverage. If we then add in uh, an SXF 115, you've increased your bandwidth. So you've uh, now got a, a lower frequency response all the way down to 50 hertz. <clears throat> All of your uh, presets for subwoofers exist within ViewNet, so that once you've connected all your amplifiers uh, to the network, you just drop them in. Obviously, your horizontal coverage stays the same. And our ratio for deployment, uh, our recommended ratio, is 4 WPM for 1 SXF 115. So moving on, uh, a different configuration. We've now uh, used, used the universal bracket, and it's pole-mounted or, or flown either way. 
you're getting the same frequency response all the way down to 50 hertz. You can just use the Icon 81 amplifier that's got enough power to drive the SXF 115, and uh, the ratio uh, is still the same. Then um, for additional uh, low frequency reinforcement, so now we're using uh, two of the SX8, um, the SX118, sorry, and this is going to increase our, our frequency response down to 41 hertz. Um, again, you can use the uh, the same presets all, all the way through uh, from display 2.3 and uh, in view net for your subwoofers um, we're using the, the same ratio so it's four to one for the uh, the single 18. as you move up and you're getting uh to the sx218 then obviously your frequency response is going to go down to 30 hertz so you're getting a pretty good full range system at this point and we're using eight mini to uh one of these subwoofers as a standard ratio uh, moving on again, so up to the SXH218, you're going all the way down to uh, 27 hertz, and we're using um, 8 WPM to one of these, and believe me, that will be a, enough bass for eight of them any day of the week. So then looking at uh, the range of the WPC range of the subwoofers, obviously we've just omitted the, um, the SXF115 uh, just because uh, with a larger format line array module, you're going to want... Um, a larger format subwoofer to go with it. Again, obviously, display 2.3 covers all of it, and specifically and only um, icon ampl amplification can uh, power the optimization. So they are sort of, a, it's a closed system. If, if you're using WPC, WPM, you have to be using icon amplifiers or it will not work. So single array, eight boxes. Um, again, uh, your, your preset is defined by what you've put into display 2.3. Your frequency response is 18 kilohertz down to 65, and as always, your horizontal coverage is 100 degrees, constant curve. Um, as soon as we start adding subwoofers, so we're on our um, SX118, so we're going to reduce that down to 41 hertz. Horizontal coverage is still the same. Obviously, that's going to um, change with your lower frequency coverage, depending on how you deploy your subwoofers. And we recommend a one-to-one -one ratio of WPC to SX118. So if you're using eight WPC, then ideally to get um, adequate levels of sub in the room, you'd be using eight SX118 uh, for that gig. Then moving up to the SX218, obviously we're going to get our <clears throat> increased bandwidth. Now we're going down to 30 hertz. Um, your horizontal coverage is the same. Again, depending on how you've deployed um, your subwoofers, your lower frequencies are going to um, behave how, hopefully, however you have designed your system to work. And there's a minimum two to one ratio for the WPC to the SX218. So. I, Obviously, it's just going to be the same amount, effectively, of drivers to the single 18 with the uh, double 18 driver. Going up to the SXH218, you're going to get your increased uh, frequency response all the way down to uh, 27 hertz, all the way up to 18 kilohertz in total. And we say a minimum ratio of three WPC to one SXH218. So... Um, just because the sub output is, is absolutely huge on these uh, SXHs, so you can have free WPC for each of those, um, hopefully as standard. But that's enough about uh, configuration, because obviously that is a very personal thing. It's a very venue and gig specific thing, and you can just this is just an example of how flexible the system can be if you need it to be. So looking at amplification and DSP, so ma making the system work. So we've got two um, two amplifiers in our Icon range. You've got the Icon 42 and you've got the Icon 81. These are the only amplifiers which have enough DSP and enough power to, uh, in terms of actual watts, to power the WPC and the WPM. I think there's a thousand FIR taps in uh, in each of them in the DSP. So this is the only uh, amplifier which can actually uh, be used with truly optimized arrays and we use ViewNet control software to connect to them to uh, to connect the whole system and to, uh, to insert our presets and uh, just for all of our system control. So Icon 42 is a four channel class D amplifier 
you've got 20,000 watts total power output, uh, 96 kilohertz DSP, but if you're going to go um, start using FIR filters, then you're going to reduce that to 48 uh, kilohertz. You've got 85 to 240 volts auto sensing main. So it doesn't matter if you're in America, it doesn't matter if you're in Australia, it doesn't matter if you're in Europe or uh, in the UK, the amplifier knows and senses the, uh, the mains that you're feeding it and it will adjust itself accordingly. Uh, and you've got analog, AES and Dante inputs and you've got Ethernet network for control and monitoring in ViewNet. Icon 81, you've got eight, this is an eight channel class D amplifier, 10,000 total watts power. So that's uh, 1,250 watts um, of output power per channel. Again, you've got 96 kilohertz DSP reducing if you're using FIR mode. Uh, you've still got the auto sensing uh, mains, still got the same analog AES and Dante inputs, and you've still got the control via uh, Ethernet uh, for monitoring in ViewNet. So the front panel, both of these um, in terms of control are exactly the same for the 42 or the 81. The only difference is you've got more outputs on the 81. You've still only got four inputs. I'll say only, that's quite a few. But both of them are four input amplifiers. The 42 is four channels of output. The 81 is eight channels of output. So what do these lights mean? So on the front, you've got, um, if you've got an on-light LED off, then the unit is not online or not connected to the network. So if you're trying to connect and that isn't working, then maybe check your IP settings, maybe check your network. If it's flashing, then it's searching for an IP address and eventually it will stop flashing and go solid because it will assign itself an IP address with uh, the auto network assigned. But I'd recommend using DHCP support or static depending on um, how you generally sort out your uh, your own network. If the light is on, the unit is connected to ViewNet. <clears throat> uh, AES, you've got an AES LED there. Uh, that will illuminate when you've got one of the inputs assigned via AES is, um, is working as your source. The overlay on the top right there uh, illuminates when there are parameters active in a group which cannot be access accessed via the front panel. So for example, if you are connected via ViewNet, um, a, a lot of the parameters, if not all of them, will be locked out on the front panel because you are you're taking sort of master control via the network, and that will lock out any uh, front panel controls. Uh, the Dante light obviously illuminates when Dante network feed is routed to the amplifier. So let's have a look at the controls. Um, so just going to the right of that, uh, you got up and down buttons which will allow you to scroll through the various pages of the parameters. So you've got EQ1, EQ2, um, all, all the various parameters uh, you, you could wish for. When you click enter, you are just confirming uh, an operation such as storing or recording a preset. So it's, it's almost like a yes button. Uh, and then on the other side of that, you've got input, utility and gain. And that allows you to select, um, it selects parameters associated within the relevant amplifier section. So as we said, you can scroll through parameters. If I select my input button, then I can, can I can scroll through the parameters that are affecting that input. If I want to look through my utility uh, parameters, I can change. If I select uh, utility, and then I can use the up and down arrows to scroll through to change my IP settings, for example. Uh, these two buttons basically do the, as I say, selecting and adjusting. So once I've found uh, my... Um, my IP settings from the utility I've scrolled down, I can then select uh, which variable I want to change. Or for example, if I've selected the input button, I've scrolled down to EQ, I can select either frequency, width or gain across the screen. And if I then want to adjust that parameter, I just turn the wheel on the right hand side and that adjusts the selected parameter. Uh, so in terms of your input monitoring, like uh, from the front panel, because obviously you can see all of this stuff in ViewNet anyway, but in terms of the, on the actual, on the unit itself, you can see if the input is muted, you'll have a red LED at the top. So you've got inputs A, B, C, and D. If, if one of them is muted, the LED would be red. Uh, and the signal level is basically the green LED. If you're all three are lit, then you're at zero dBU. If the yellow is lit, well, one yellow is lit, you're at plus six, plus 12, and then red into clip. 
So the, uh, the, the clip LED will indicate overload at 1 dB before the clip. So if you start seeing it flickering, then maybe you need to wind it down a little bit. And you will start seeing signal on the front panel at approximately minus 40 dBU. So if you're sending and you know you're sending everything through, you might want to just turn it up a little bit. And uh, when you get to minus 40 dBU, you'll start seeing it on the actual amplifier unit itself. On the output, so obviously they're just numbered, so outputs one, two, three, and four. Uh, you can uh, view your output levels on the front panel of the amplifier. Obviously, the, the mute buttons at the bottom there, they are buttons, not just LEDs, so you can actually physically mute them um, from the front panel. And it doesn't matter whether you're uh, using ViewNet, as in your controls might be locked out on the screen, you can still mute um, the amplifier. So that the red LEDs on each output indicates when the amp protection systems are working or when the channel is clipping. So if it's reaching limit, if the amp is over or the speaker is over, it's going to indicate to you um, exactly what's going on. Uh, obviously, it's got your output signal. You've got uh, your output mutes, which just discussed. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see um, that the, the red LEDs indicates a signal 6 dB below uh, the the limiter threshold or when the threshold of the excursion limiter has been exceeded or the thermal limiter because there is free stage limiting on these um, Icon 81s and the 42s. The limit LED indicates that the threshold of the output has been reached and bridge mode below there that, that's another LED that will glow when, um, when you've decided to bridge a channel either with your own presets or you've actually entered a bridged preset such as um, the SXH218 has got bridge presets for uploading in VNet if you require the extra headroom. So looking at the output panel, you've got four analog, analog, four analog inputs and links, and you've got one AES input, but as we all know, AES carries two channels down the XLR, so you've actually got two AES inputs just through the one channel and a link out. You've got a primary and a redundant secondary uh, Dante input, and you've also got your Ethernet uh, connectivity for UNet control. Uh, you've also got an AUX port and relay for snapshot recall from an auxiliary switch if you uh, require one, and external monitoring. And you've got a 32 amp um, Paracon input there. On your outputs, they're both the same on the Icon 81 and the 42. It's just that all of the 81s are all four cores going at all times, um, just because having eight NL4s in the back of the amp flight would be a, a bit excessive. Uh, if you're bridging a channel, then you can see that um, you're, you are plus one, minus two, and you'll need to create a cable which is uh, capable of carrying that signal if it is required. So we actually make... Um, racks up we have a specific rack design that we make that can be bought in one package and that's like our recommended way of deploying them uh in, in an icon uh, 81 amp rack you have 32 channels it's 30,000 watts total power output obviously you've got the 96 kilohertz uh, dsp it reduced again in far mode you've got the voltage sensing mains analog aes and dante input panel which uh will be patched for you NLA and NL4 speak on output panel, which I'll have a look at in a second, and Ethernet and network control. Of course, that's on the uh, input panel as well. And you've got a 32A three phase power um, distro on the uh, output panel as well. So here's our um, output panel design for the Icon 81. So that will be the rear of uh, that, the rack from the previous slide. And as you can see, you've got uh, the distro, the output distro is broken down to three sections. So you've got top amplifier, middle amplifier, bottom amplifier, and all of these, uh, you've got six NL8s and 12 NL4s. And as you can see that they are all linked in parallel, so you can use either or depending on your needs. And obviously there you've got your 32 amp um, free phase input. The Icon 42 rack, you've got 12 channels of class D amplification. It's 60,000 watts total power output. It's an incredibly powerful rack. Again, 96K uh, DSP. Uh, you've got the auto sensing mains. You've got the same input panel as the uh, the Icon 81, and you've got a slightly different output panel, but we've still used NL8s and NL4s. 
uh, and you've still got the Ethernet networking control, and you've got the same 32 amp uh, three phase uh, C form as standard. So here you can see less output, so you've got less patches, obviously. So you've got three um, NL8s and six NL4s. They're again wired in parallel, so you can use either or depending on your needs. The input panel, which is the same for both of those um, amp racks, we've got a, it's almost like a miniature six way um, Veeam connector and uh, a link out, and that will allow you to put your, um, to, to patch six analog um, inputs in, into that rack in any configuration you want. You've got primary and secondary Dante ports. Your network, um, your control network via ViewNet, I would always put on the, on the same network as the primary uh, port, so that will go down the same primary switch there. And you have AES, AES and an AES link out, which you could link onto another amp rack if you so required. So let's just have a look at um, the actual wiring configuration, the wiring protocols for each of these boxes finally. So on the WPM, you can see you've got, because um, it's a passive box, you only need uh, two wires. So you've actually got um, plus or minus two link through, but they do link um, either way on the out output of the, the second NL4. And uh, that is true for the uh, WPC as well, as you can see on the right there. But obviously we need all four calls because it is a biamp box. Looking at the, uh, the subwoofer wiring for the SX range, it does vary um, between a couple of them, so it's worth knowing the difference. Uh, if, if you've got a, uh, an SXF115, that is just a, um, a single pair, so you've got a, an input, and uh, obviously you've got all four pins that link through, and that is the same um, protocol on the SX118, the single direct radiating 18. But moving up to the SX, 218 as i mentioned before you have a, a different lf um, a different driver being powered from a different channel in each of the boxes so in one sx218 pins one and two or plus or minus one are going to lf1 plus or minus two are going to lf2 and you can link them uh to another box as you can see like input link um is just go straight through in parallel on the NL4, which means that you can power two drivers from one channel. It's just that they're in different boxes, but I will show you that in a second. And the SXH218, it has an input and it has a link, and there's a pin swap on the link, which um, I'll again show you in a minute, but it's very important to remember that there is an input and a link. You have to get them the right way around, or you're gonna be sending the wrong signal to the wrong sub. So from a Icon 81, in uh, the highest, or I guess the lowest resolution, which is four box resolution, you can have four WPM per channel of amplification. And as you can see with the links, that is how you would wire them. For WPC, the lowest resolution is three box. So that is how you would wire them there. You just obviously go in on your top box and then just link them down. The SXF-115 on the 81, you can have a maximum of eight SXF-115s per amplifier, so that is one box per amplifier channel. The, uh, the SX-118, so moving up to the 18-inch uh, subwoofer, you can have a maximum of eight of them per Icon 42. If you're using it, it with an 81, then... Um, it, you uh, you want to bridge the, the channel, really, to get the maximum uh, headroom that you need. But an Icon 42 has got absolutely buckets of headroom for that, so that will do uh, two per channel, um, no problem. And here we are, the SX218. As you can see from the, the, the diagram on the left there, we're powering two drivers but they are in different boxes. So driver one in, in the top box there and driver one in the bottom box is on channel one. Driver two in the top box, driver two in the bottom box is on channel two. As you can see, they're not in the same box, so I hope that makes sense in that diagram. We, we, we've designed it that way so that you can have extremely, um, uh, extremely high populations of audio channels and DSP going to a broadside um, array if you require it. So you can actually have higher resolution and a broadside than the amount of boxes 
uh, or the subwoofers cabinets that you have in the array itself. Uh, in the SXH, it is a maximum of one SXH per channel because you're powering both drivers um, in each box individually. And I'm just going to show you the wiring schematic of that and talk about that pin swap a little bit more. So as you can see, channel one from the amplifier goes in and it, it goes into the loudspeaker via a four core and it powers both drivers. Channel two goes into the uh, into the same loudspeaker, but as you can see, it's got a pin swap, so it comes out on plus or minus one on the link NL4. And that allows you to send two channels of audio um, down the same cable, link out, and then power a individual um, SXH218 on the other side of that. And finally, a really brief look at the software. So we've got ViewNet 2.1 and Display 2.3. So Display 2.3 is the proprietary software for all the WP products. It's a numerical optimization to define cabinet angles and DSP coefficients. It's a really straightforward workflow. Like You just work through it from, uh, from left to right and uh, inputting your venue design, and you will have an optimized output. The DSP coefficients for the optimized array can then be loaded into the icon amplifiers via an exported file with our uh, ViewNet software. But your input into the software, you need venue data, so uh, you need measurements of the venue itself. You need your sound design objectives, and you need to know what loudspeakers you actually have on hand that you're going to be using at the venue. So as you can see, the workflow from top to bottom, you, you've chosen your array. Say you've got WPC, you cho choose your WPC. You've drawn a slice through your venue. You've defined your audience area and your criteria. Are they sitting? Are they standing? Are they really close to the stage? Are they far away? You're then going to um, allow the software to mechanically optimize the array, giving you the optimum acoustic output um, from the, the uh, array you have available. You can then uh, double check your rigging information to make sure it's safe. You can then optimize the array uh, numerically. So that's going to use um, a lot of very clever mathematics to try and give you the best output um, possible to give you a, a very sort of linear response from front to back. And um, you, you can then export the array preset, which is all of that information in an optimization file, which you uh, put into the Icon 81 or 42 amplifier. <clears throat> and that will give you um, really quite stunning results. The output of this software is um, the D2P file, which is the optimized array um, preset. So we upload a D2P file into our amplifiers. You can output mechanical data in the form of a report if you require one. Um, you can output Ease data. So obviously it's not uh, for people who use Ease. A stand, you can't use a standard GLL because every single one of these arrays output is different. So every time you optimize an array, um, you would need a new GLL effectively. But you can use an export from display to calibrate a GLL in, uh, in Ease 4. Uh, it won't work in Ease uh, Focus, sadly. Um, and you can also export a 3D array wire um, like diagram in the format of a DXF file. So with the array presets or the export, as I said, every time a system is deployed, it is optimized to suit the venue and the audience requirements. You can calculate the best possible array shape for a venue. You can deliver extremely even frequency response throughout the audience. You can control the SPL profile across the audience area, and you can actually define that uh, yourself uh, if required. As standard, it's plus or minus 3 dB. So you've got a 6 dB drop across the audience area. Uh, you can create multiple optimizations for each array to suit audience conditions. So um, you can even put environmental conditions like your temperature and humidity in. If it gets hotter throughout the day, you can have a preset for the evening when it becomes cooler, whatever you need. There's no need to second guess. You can really trust the software. As I said before, it is in terms of direct audio um, within plus or minus one uh, dB. So ViewNet is the control software. Uh, it's a proprietary control software for MLA, CD Live, Icon amplifiers. Everything works in the same network. You can upload optimizations created into Display 2.3 into the Icon amplifiers via ViewNet. You can also control system levels, EQ, delay, um, any parameter across any of the, uh, the products that we have. 
Uh, you can manage the presets for individual arrays, individual and global ganging. You can store and recall um, parametric equalization curves, depending on the product. It's not supported for all products. Um, store and recall system configurations, monitor the system's performance, and you also use this software to connect the, um, to all of our equipment if uh, firmware updates are required. So yeah, pretty much a global control piece of software. But that's it really from me for, um, for WP series.